Wells. I'm going to speak to you today about the subject of Freemasonry and religion. I'm not a member of the fraternity. I'm a professor of United States history at the University of San Francisco, and I've spent years learning about the history of Masonry in California and the United States. For a printed copy of my talk, along with its documentation, please return to the website of the Worldwide Exemplification of Freemasonry, or feel free to contact me directly through the biographical page of this Masonic lecture series. The talk is entitled, Is Freemasonry a Religion? Learning from a 19th Century Masonic Debate. During the last three decades of the 19th century, a fascinating debate took place inside the Masonic Fraternity of Northern California. This debate centered on the question, is Freemasonry a religion? It's relevant today for two reasons. For one, this debate was not an isolated phenomenon. There's evidence the same controversy was occurring at this time, not only in Northern California, but across many jurisdictions of the fraternity in the United States. Indeed, arguments concerning Masonry's relationship to religious faith have surfaced intermittently throughout the entire history of the Brotherhood, from the early 18th century up through our own times. So there is something perennial about this question that keeps returning to haunt the fraternity. This fact suggests the second reason for the subject's relevance. If this question is one that has always been with Masonry, then perhaps the dialogue surrounding it contains some valuable lessons that could point toward new directions for Freemasons to take as they approach the 300th anniversary of the founding of the Grand Lodge in England in 1717. In the early 1800s, Lutherans confronted a similar milestone at the approach of the 300th anniversary of Martin Luther's historic act in the year 1517 of nailing his 95 theses on the door of the court church at Wittenberg, Germany, signaling the start of the Protestant Reformation. The 19th century Lutheran's consciousness of living through a 300th anniversary touched off a great revival of ritual and piety that energized the Lutheran branch of Protestantism for well over the next hundred years. So maybe Freemasonry is on the verge of such a revival today, inspired by the birth of modern fraternalism nearly 300 years ago. If so, looking back at the lessons of its long and intricate history would be an important part of that process of renewal. Now, this particular debate over the religious character of Masonry began in San Francisco in 1869 with the opening issues of the first newspaper put out by the fraternity in California, the Masonic Mirror. The journal's editor, a man named Amasa W. Bishop, who was a member of Oriental Lodge No. 144, quickly found himself embroiled in a controversy with the newspaper of the Congregationalists in Northern California, The Pacific. The Pacific had pounced on the Masonic Mirror's introductory description of the Brotherhood's principles as proof that Freemasonry was indeed a rival religion and not simply a social and benevolent order as it often claimed to be. Bishop's reply is instructive because it set a characteristically ambivalent tone for this surprising debate that would unfold within the fraternity over the next 30 years. Bishop began by insisting on the need to distinguish what he called religion from theology. If this distinction is granted, he argued, he could concede that Masonry, quote, does claim to teach a pure religious sentiment of the heart and feelings, the true religion of Christianity, not the dogmas of Christianity, unquote. A religion, he went on to say, quote, older than the Christian era and cherished long before Christianity as a religious faith had an existence, unquote. <clears throat> Yet Bishop also maintained the fraternity seeks no encroachment upon the legitimate province of any church. Well, notice the competing strains in this formulation. Masonry teaches religion, but not a theology. It is true Christianity, but existed before Christianity came into existence. 
And with it all, Masonry does not desire to take the place of any church. These statements, contradictory as they might sound to an outsider, would make perfect sense to fraternity members of the late 19th century. Indeed, they could still be voiced today, which also shows just how little Freemasonry has changed over the past 130 years. Significantly, this first statement by a massive bishop in what soon became an internal controversy within the fraternity, had emerged in response to an attack by one of the earliest Protestant bodies to establish itself on the West Coast, the Congregationalists, today known as the United Church of Christ. Beginning at the time of the Gold Rush and extending through the end of the 19th century, the Protestant denominations in the West competed with one another for the conversion of souls in what was thought of as a vitally important campaign to civilize the newly settled regions of the country. Within this effort, the spiritual destiny of the male population posed a particular challenge to any Protestant church leader, because men were nearly twice as reluctant as women to join a Protestant church. The nationwide religious census taken in 1906 by the United States Bureau of the Census reported that men accounted for only about one-third of total church membership in the nine leading Protestant denominations of California. And so, it is not surprising that many Protestant churchmen should have regarded Masonry and other fraternal orders with suspicion and alarm, since these groups threatened to siphon off the spiritual energies of their potential male recruits. This environment of competition with the Protestant churches will turn out to provide the most important context for understanding the significance of the internal Masonic debate over whether the fraternity was a religion. Now, in reply to criticisms of the sort raised by the Congregationalists, most official spokesmen for the fraternity hastened to reassure the churches and synagogues that Freemasonry represented no challenge to their function. Masonry, quote, does not array itself against any religion or proclaim itself a substitute therefore, unquote, asserted California's Grand Master, George C. Perkins, in 1875. A year later, Grand Orator John H. C. Bonte stated the same viewpoint with equal forcefulness. Some say that the Brotherhood is a rival to the Church, acknowledged Bonte, and that it detains men from Church attendance. But the Masonic Order carefully abstains from entrenchment upon times and seasons claimed by the Church, he, con he countered, and offers nothing as substitute for sacraments, ordinances, or doctrine. Nor does the fraternity deprive the church of money, Bonte added, for there are few Masons who do not also contribute to the sustenance of their church. One of the most common phrases used by the fraternity's officers to emphasize Masonry's position of deference toward the churches was that which called Freemasonry, quote, religion's handmaid or handmaiden, unquote. Religion shall find in us one of her most useful auxiliaries, declared California's Grand Orator Thomas Gard in 1879. One of her most fair and generous handmaidens, he said. Ten years later, Grand Master Hiram Newton Rucker elaborated on the same theme. I'm quoting him here. It has been asserted, times without number, that Masonry never designed to take the place of religion. The chief purposes and objects of each are greatly at variance. The direct aim of the Church is to impart knowledge of God and faith in His revealed will, while Masonry inculcates the practice of virtue, but it supplies no scheme of redemption from sin. As the handmaid of religion, it may and often does act as the vestibule that introduces its votaries into the temple of divine truth. End of quote. And again in 1897, California's Grand Orator, Francis Ellsworth Baker, drew a firm line between religion, which he called a system of faith and worship, which treats primarily of man's relation to his creator, and masonry, which he called a code of moral philosophy, which treats primarily of the mutual obligations which exist among men. It is not wise, counseled the Grand Orator, 
for a Masonic brother to say that a practical application of Masonic principles constitutes a religion good enough for him. Well, as this last warning by Grand Orator Baker implied, some members of the Brotherhood apparently did regard Masonry as their own brand of religion, or else why would such a warning be necessary? In fact, both literary and statistical evidence suggest that the amicable notion of Freemasonry as handmaiden to the churches, which was certainly the fraternity's official position, did not reflect the sentiments and actions of the majority of the membership. Many fraternal spokesmen, for example, often refer to Masonry and Christianity as equals, as if the two were fully equivalent competitors from an organizational standpoint. Quote, if in your walks you meet a man whose intemperate habits is a reproach, wrote the Masonic Mirror in the early 1870s in the context of defending the fraternity against a charge of corruption, do not point to him and say, there is a representative of Masonry or of Christianity or of Odd Fellowship, unquote. Later in the 1870s, a grand orator reasoned that if human nature were perfect, there might be no need for masonry, since all would live according to the church. But he equally then added, there would be no need for the church, since all would live according to Masonic principles. As human nature is not perfect, he concluded, there is ample room for both organizations. The Masonic Record, a short-lived Masonic newspaper coming out of San Francisco in the mid-1880s, showed a similar tendency to place the fraternity on an equal footing with the churches of the day. In an article recalling the anti-Masonic crusade touched off by the William Morgan incident of the 1820s, the Record's editor argued that even if there had been some Masonic foul play connected with this event, this would only prove that there were some bad men in the order, quote, a fact that can be alleged against every church in the land, the editor added. Well, all three of the examples I've just given took for granted the idea that the lodge was equivalent to the church, not subordinate to it. Similarly, the Brotherhood in California insisted that for a Masonic burial to occur, the lodge not the deceased member's church, had to have firm control over the service. In 1891, the Jurisprudence Committee of the California Grand Lodge explained the meaning of this rule. We do not understand this to mean that no service except the Masonic burial service can be performed at the burial of one who has requested burial. Masonic burial, the Jurisprudence Committee wrote, but only that the lodge must, in the procession, occupy the place of honor, and must have charge of and conclude the service. Twelve years earlier, the Grand Lodge had also ruled that a lodge should refuse to pay the funeral expenses for a member if his widow chose a church service over the Masonic burial service. Well, for the fraternity to view a member's lodge and church to be in such potential competition over so important a ceremony as the one when a man is laid to rest, there had to be the prior assumption of spiritual equivalence between the two organizations. There were even those in the order who implied that Masonry, as a religion, was superior to the churches. The aforementioned jurisprudence committee's explanation of the rule on funerals did so, in effect, by reserving for the Brotherhood the right to lead the burial procession and conduct the graveside service, the central observances according to Masonic custom. The committee conceded little to other religious bodies when it offered to assist them in any prior rites, since these other religious ceremonies did not challenge the fraternity's practice in any significant degree, and could even be thought of as being subsumed in this way under the universalistic umbrella of Freemasonry. Some of the very spokesmen who defended the Masonic record of non-encroachment upon the domain of the churches could not help adding a note of competitive boastfulness to their comments. In the same 1888 address in which he set forth the official handmaiden formula, Grand Master Rucker nevertheless added that there was no reason to think that if a man were denied membership in the lodge, 
he would necessarily then embrace the church. Quote, it is not strange, Rucker went so far as to say, that many who are adverse to creeds express a preference for this great institution, he was referring to masonry, whose only aim is to promote the peace and happiness of man, unquote. And for a final example of this tendency, Edwin A. Sherman of Mission Lodge, number 169, the man who wrote the two-volume history of the 19th century California fraternity, 50 years of masonry in California, and an important local Masonic figure all through these years. Sherman expressed an attitude of wounded pride while eulogizing a brother Mason at a lodge of sorrow held by the Scottish Rite. Wounded pride that, again, could only have been predicated on a view of the fraternity as fully equal, if not superior, to any church. Quote, there were no Masons at the funeral of Brother Ainsworth, noted Sherman regretfully. Some of us attended in our private capacity and listened to the minister's statement that jarred our heartstrings. And he quoted the minister at this point. That it was censurable because Brother Ainsworth did not belong to any church, unquote. Well, clearly to Sherman, it was not censurable that Brother Ainsworth had not belonged to a church, or else his heartstrings would not have been jarred at the minister's statement. Years earlier, Sherman, together with a mass of bishop, had proudly proclaimed of masonry, quote, we believe in a bright, glorious, happy religion that looks upon God as our Father and this bright and joyous world as the work of his hands, unquote. The optimism of their pronouncement did not fully match the fraternity's dominant spiritual outlook, which I believe has always been more subdued about man's destiny, but Sherman's and Bishop's recognition that their Masonic faith constituted a quote-unquote religion carried far more truth than the organization's officers typically cared to acknowledge. Cyrus Moody Plummer, editor of the most important of all the 19th century Masonic journals coming out of San Francisco, the Trestle Board, took an even more forthright stand on the question of Masonry as a religion. To begin with, he regularly and directly addressed this question. And he was not shy in attacking those in the fraternity who would relegate the Brotherhood's spiritual role to one of religion's mere handmaiden. In 1891, he identified himself wholeheartedly with, quote, that class of Freemasons whom a recent Grand Master of New York had assailed as those, thank God we have few, who state that the Lodge is good enough church for them, and that to be a good Mason is to be a good church member, Unquote. In rebuttal to what that Grand Master of New York had said, Plummer quoted a Methodist preacher who had recently defended membership in the fraternity as equally acceptable to that in a church. The following year, Plummer added more substance to his views, defending the idea that Masonry taught the, quote, pure and undefiled religion, unquote, advanced in the New Testament book of James. His reference was to James chapter 1, verse 27, which read, quote, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world, unquote. A verse which with clear echoes in the common practices of Freemasonry. Quote, the teachings and precepts of Masonry are the highest type of religion, Plummer asserted, and these teachings and precepts should not be prostituted to be the handmaid of any system of creed or dogmatic theology, unquote, he wrote. The editor had learned through Masonry to respect the principles, quote, taught not alone by our teacher, that is, Jesus Christ, but by all the great founders of the many systems of religion, which are contracted, he meant reduced in value here, because they cannot embrace men of all creeds and races as can Masonry, when not prevented by prejudice, unquote. Plummer found additional support for his perspective in the views of the nationally known Scottish Rite ritualist Albert Pike, whose words he reprinted for the Trestle Board's readership. And here is what Pike had to say on the subject. It has been said that Masonry is not a religion, 
if it be said that it is not Christianity or Hebraism or Mohammedanism or Parsiism, this is true. But there was religion in the world before any of these were. And if the faith of the enlightened thinkers of Greece, Rome, of Egypt, and India, who believed that there was one divine creator and preserver of the universe, its lord or ruler, loving and adoring him as beneficent and wise, and that the intelligent soul of man did not cease to be at the death of the body, if this was religion, surely Freemasonry, having the same belief and trustful reverence, is likewise a religion. That was Albert Pike speaking in 1888 at the cornerstone ceremony for the Masonic Cathedral in Washington, D.C. Now, before we stop to evaluate all this data and attempt to say what it means, we need to add one last piece of evidence to our discussion about this late 19th century debate over whether Freemasonry was a religion. This evidence is of a statistical nature. We need to know just how many Masons maintained additional affiliations with religious bodies outside the Brotherhood. Many of the fraternity's grand officers, as we have seen, stated or implied that the average Mason also belonged to the church or synagogue of his choice. As Grand Orator John Bonte had put it, there were few in the order who did not contribute to the sustenance of their church. Such a picture was surely in keeping with the notion of the fraternity as an auxiliary arm of the churches, a handmaid to religion. But how true was this picture? The fact is that an overwhelming majority of Masons did not belong to any Protestant church or Jewish synagogue. Church and synagogue membership appealed to the men of the fraternity just slightly more than it did to the overall adult non-Catholic male population of San Francisco, which is to say, not very strongly at all. In fact, just about 17% of the roughly 8,000 white Freemasons in San Francisco during the 1870 to 1900 period belonged to another house of worship, nowhere near the proportion necessary to support the handmaiden formula. From the picture drawn by many of the Brotherhood's leaders, one would have expected at least a majority of Masons to have regularly attended a church or synagogue, but this was not the case. So why, if the great majority of 19th century Freemasons belonged to no outside religious institution, did the fraternity maintain as its official position that Masonry served as the handmaid to the churches, or even as the handmaid to religion? The answer is certainly not that the fraternity drew back from meeting the religious needs of its members. With its moral teachings, its strong charitable practices, its creation of fellowship among its members, and its rituals that taught so clearly a reverence for God and through the story of King Solomon's chief architect, a fervent hope for an afterlife of peace and contentment, Freemasonry fulfilled all of the central functions that any Christian or Jewish denomination did in the United States. And all across the country throughout the 19th century, from the towns of Connecticut following the American Revolution, to the first communities of the new Louisiana Purchase Lands, to the Sierra mining camps at the time of the gold rush, plenty of ordinary Masons spoke and acted as if their lodges were their churches just as later Californians like Amasa Bishop, Edwin Sherman, and C. Moody Plummer did. Why then the reluctance on the part of most grand officers openly to proclaim the fraternity as the religion that it most evidently was? There were two broad reasons for this, I think. The first one had to do with fraternity members' conflicted feelings about the term religion itself. Mason so often identified the very concept of religion with theological dogmatism or intolerant zealotry that many were uncomfortable with the notion that they themselves belonged to a religious organization, complete with its own spiritual beliefs and practices. Masonry had suffered at the hands of two significant religious forces during its long history, the Roman Catholic Church and the Evangelical Protestant Movement. Having seen religious bodies act intolerantly toward themselves, many Masons may have believed that to be quote-unquote religious 
meant to hold to a rigid dogma and to compel others to subscribe to that dogma as well. Yet these difficulties with the definition of religion do not tell the whole story. There was another reason, even more important, that had to do with the unstated rivalry between the fraternal orders and the churches. C. Moody Plummer recognized this angle of the question in an 1895 editorial when he wrote that the doctrine of masonry as handmade to religion served only to protect the professional prestige of the Protestant ministers. And indeed it did, plus more. The grand officers who held to the handmade formulation were men whose official positions made them especially sensitive to how the fraternity was regarded by important laymen and ministers in the surrounding Protestant community. The denial that masonry was a religion paid superficial deference to the Protestant churches, thus helping to ward off any return of anti-masonry. It enabled ministers and other denominational Christians to join the fraternity without feeling they had to choose between the lodge and the church. It maintained good personal relationships across denominational boundaries for fraternal leaders who might value such alliances in their civic or political pursuits. And it protected masonry, a thoroughly lay institution whose officers had never attended seminaries and were unschooled in the ways of religious polemics from having to defend intellectually the Brotherhood's spiritual stance. All in all, the denial that masonry was a religion was a highly effective rhetorical position for the top officials of the fraternity to take. And they backed up this stance with forceful actions. When in 1879, a Sacramento, California lodge began to conduct its initiation rituals on Sunday, the Grand Lodge came down hard on the subordinate lodge to stop its practice. And when in the early 1890s, C. Moody Plummer proposed to a meeting of the Past Masters Association of San Francisco that the Brotherhood hold an observance on Sundays for Masons, quote, to listen to opinions of religious maxims inculcated in Masonry, unquote, and to impart moral instruction, the Past Masters Association loudly rejected the idea. In these ways, and for all these reasons, the denial that Masonry was a religion carried the day as the official position of the fraternity. So long as men flooded into the fraternity, as they did during the later years of the 19th century and the early decades of the 20th century, it seemed to be a winning formula. But what was lost in the process? Well, mainly something of the truth about Freemasonry. And in an ironic way, a position that was meant to deflect any return of anti-Masonry may unintentionally have helped keep a certain current of anti-Masonic sentiment alive. For there would continue to be men of sincere religious convictions, from the editors of the Congregationalist California newspaper in 1869, all the way up through certain men and groups today, who couldn't help but notice the religious character of the Brotherhood and therefore perceive a certain hypocrisy in the fraternity's denial that it stood on a similar footing to the various denominations of Christianity and Judaism. And that brings our discussion back to the present. There seems to be much talk within the Masonic order about what it might take to spark a revival of interest, especially among younger people, in the principles and practice of fraternalism. Certainly the ongoing tendency among many Grand Lodges and local lodges to become more visible in their local communities through sponsoring scholarship funds, cleanup campaigns, and other benevolent activities will help bring the Masonic Brotherhood to the attention of people who may wish to join in the Fellowship of the Lodge. But I can't help but think that a reluctance among Masons to present their organization as a religious body deprives the fraternity of the chance to accentuate its greatest strength and the true source of its benevolent energies. The religious message of Masonry is both unique and compelling, a ritualistic form of monotheistic devotion that does not require exclusive allegiance by its members. That is, members may also belong to other denominations. Modern America might prove surprisingly receptive to such a message of tolerant spirituality. 